recording. You'll see a little blurb. There we go. So um, once again, hello, everybody. This is Lisa Letourneau with Maine DHHS. Thank you for joining us. This is the third in what's been um, seen as a short series of uh, webinars. I'm going to share screen and just show um, a brief intro here before I turn it over to our guest today. So the goal of these webinars was to provide support and education uh, to clinicians caring for people in the wake of the Lewiston events, uh, talk about other resources, and um, ideally try to coordinate efforts. Um, this is, I mentioned the third and three, we have had uh, national and local uh, speakers. Uh, we're working with available resources to see what we might offer after this, but um, today we're joined uh, by both Jesse Higgins and Courtney Plazin to talk about trauma-informed care. We will leave time for a discussion and questions, and then I'll go briefly through um, updates on other available resources. Um, so with that, I wanted to introduce our two guests. Uh, Jesse Higgins is a psychiatric uh, mental health nurse practitioner who's the director of behavioral health integration at Northern Light Health Acadia. And Courtney Pladsden, uh, doctor of nursing practice, is our main care medical director. And uh, both have considerable experience on the topic of trauma-informed care. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it to Jesse, who's going to kick us off. Good afternoon, everyone. Courtney is going to be advancing the slides. We have a shared slide deck. So uh, just to say a little bit more about the work that I do, I am, um, I am a psychiatric nurse practitioner. I practice clinically in a family medicine clinic. And um, when I am on call, I cover uh, psychiatric care in the emergency rooms across the state. So the majority of my clinical, really all of my clinical practice is in medical settings, either uh, primary care, outpatient specialty, or emergency rooms. And so I'm going to go through, go over a few things right in the beginning here um, about trauma and stress and how they impact primarily patient behavior, how patients might present. So First, just want to acknowledge, you know, stressors are any stimuli that disrupt our baseline functioning. And that can be all of these big recent events aside, um, can be things like, you know, struggling with the electronic health record at work or feeling like there's too many patients to see in a given day or having a, you know, a teenager come home real late at night and being worried about them. So we learn how to navigate those stressors using our coping skills, um, all sorts of things, whether it's going outside, walking, um, spending time with friends, whatever it is, some quiet time to yourself. Um, but what happens when those stressors keep coming and coming from different directions, even the, the less um, intense ones, over time, we start to develop expectant behavior. We see it coming. We get develop this, this defense. So with things like being as busy at work as we all have been these past few years, um, it can be something as simple as kind of unconsciously disengaging from our patients, right? Because there's just too many and everybody is so acute now in all of these settings. So we just, we go in, we do the prescriptions, the exams, do the job, but we aren't as present. Um, as we were formerly. And over time, you know, one of the other things that's happened is people sort of before the pandemic who were coming home having a glass of wine after work um, started to find that that was spiraling out of control and that they were, um, you know, many of us were using whatever coping skills might have been maybe on the line of, of not ideal, started to become really maladaptive and take over our usual coping skills. So I say this, and I'm saying uh, uh, we uh, and us uh, around this. My piece of this presentation is really around patient care, and then we'll shift to Courtney to talk about um, us as a healthcare team more. But the reality is, and she and I have been discussing this, we are the patients, right? There is no us and them. We are seeking care for ourselves and our families the same way everyone else is. So... Over time, we, we can establish a cycle of de defense. Um, and so we start to see that with patients. Um, and then we have trauma. So are there, there are those stressors that come on a daily basis. And then we have the global trauma of the pandemic, um, 
prior to that, um, something around, you know, 90% of adults had survived at least one significant trauma in their lifetime. Now I'm, I'm pretty comfortable saying it's 100%. Everybody has been through a traumatic experience. So then um, you, uh, in addition to those events that were experienced by, I think, pretty much all of us as physically or emotionally harmful or at least threatening, what we want to do is see how we can mitigate the adverse effects of functioning um, and well-being over time, the way that that impacts us. So the shooting in Lewiston, um, when we think about cumulative trauma, individuals are coming in to see us who have individual experiences of trauma, many of them of neglect and abuse and um, mistreatment over the course of their lives, significant car accidents, natural disasters. People, people walk around sort of learning how to deal with those things or using you know, maladaptive coping mechanisms to just survive. And then we had the pandemic and, and all that happened to us and our families. And now we have the events in Maine and the Lewiston shooting and um, the way this has impacted us as a Maine community, certainly for those of you who are based in the Lewis and Auburn area, um, the impact has been, you know, just just destabilizing, you know, for the community. And um, so it's it's really people are coming in to see us on mass. Um, and I I spoke even about a year ago with a, a colleague of mine in pediatrics and. He said that when he started practice, you know, a, a decade or so ago, about probably 20 to 25 percent of the kids he saw coming in for acute visits were presenting with some sort of behavioral health or mental health wellness issue. And now he said it's probably 90 percent. So just want to acknowledge that all of you working in medical practices are doing complex mental health psychiatric work with everyone. Um, next slide, please. So just wanted to go through quickly our reactions to trauma, right? We used to talk about fight or flight um, in the olden days when I was in school, we just said fight or flight, and we were neglecting this real, very biological response of freezing, stilling and constricting behavior in response to trauma. And this can be an acute trauma being um, assaulted in some way or you know, the, this trauma that happens over time. And if you look at um, overcompliance and denial of needs, we see people just kind of going along with whatever. Um, there's the social isolation and withdrawal. And then really important, I think too, is if you look at the fight, the physical uh, arousal, especially from complex trauma, can present as aggression, trouble concentrating and hyperactivity. And when you look at the recently just skyrocketed rates of ADHD diagnoses and stimulant prescribing. Um, a lot of trauma, especially in kids, but also in adults can look like ADHD, can be trouble concentrating, trouble with focus, physical agitation. And when you add a stimulant to that, um, thing, things tend to get worse. Um, people who have experienced trauma also sometimes seek stimulants because it helps to um, remain hypervigilant, which is what they, they may feel they need to feel safe. Next slide, please. So quick neurological um, manifestations of trauma, just so we understand that this is really brain-based, knowing that you know, the brain communicates with the entire uh, rest of our bodies. But you look at how these parts of the brain are impacted by trauma, the neurobiology, we look at the um, prefrontal cortex, which is right our clear thinking, decision making, um, and social awareness, awareness of others. That is shrunk. In the executive control is is area is actually smaller, working less efficiently in people who have survived trauma, um, especially in the aftermath of acute trauma. And then you're looking at emotional regulation, which is. Um, managed in part by the anterior cingulate cortex, and that also is smaller. So our ability to regulate our emotions, to think clearly. And then we add to that the hippocampus also decreased in size and functionality. And that is what helps us differentiate our memories, perhaps the memories of the trauma from what is happening right now. 
So that's why often people who have survived a significant trauma can have, um, it's often not conscious, an emotion, a smell, an interaction with someone that somehow reminds them of that trauma. And that's often when we see in medical practices, um, patients responding to something with what seems an out of proportion, irrational response with anger or anxiety. And um, it's hard for us to understand. That's likely because something has been triggered um, in their in their history. And so now as we're caring for these folks who have just recently survived a significant trauma, that's going to be heightened um, and something to be expected. People will be more agitated. They'll be more anxious. Um, the amygdala, which is fear and threat detection, that is enhanced, which makes perfect sense, right? When you survived a trauma, especially complex trauma, trauma over, over time, you are gonna feel like you need to be on guard. Next slide, please. So the good news neurologically is that there's also a lot of functionality of our brain that helps us recover. Um, so neuroplasticity, especially for kids, um, these are change the changes that occur in response to trauma also um, uh, are affected by responses to supportive adults. This is true in adulthood too. We too have neuroplasticity when we are, you know, they talk about things like forest bathing, walking in the woods, when we are doing the things that feed our soul, being around others in a healing way, in a healing space that helps us recover. Neurogenesis, we used to think that um, neuroge that growing new neurons stopped at a certain point in young adulthood. And now that's not, we know that to be not true. We are, neurogenesis occurs throughout our lifetime. So the ability to, to make those new connections continues. And then neural networks, the more intensely and frequently a neural network fires, the stronger it's wiring meaning that the more we are reinforcing for our patients and for one another, these positive healing messages, um, the better, the more effective it will be in actually causing and helping to create these neurological changes. Next slide, please. So just, I'm gonna run through this uh, a little bit in more detail, but I just wanna name the key principles of trauma-informed care because these are the things that make those uh, neurologic changes in the previous slide happen. These are the elements that, that sort of serve as, as guideposts. Um, and, and especially as we think about creating these welcoming spaces in our practices, safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment of voice and choice, and cultural, historical, and gender issues. Next slide, please. So I just wanna talk about these a little bit more because what I want is for folks who are participating in this conversation to walk away with something usable. And I should say that our plan is that I am gonna speak for about another five minutes and then Courtney is going to speak for about 20 minutes and then we will have 20 minutes for our conversation and discussion. So we want to, I want to make sure you know that your uh, opportunity to participate in this discussion is going to be really important. Um, safety. So people with trauma histories, um, it is incredibly important for us to establish and maintain appropriate boundaries. Um, the way that this manifests at times is when we have these communicated, clearly communicated expectations of how people need to um, you know, seek care, call for refills, um, interact in the practice, the protocols that we have in the practices. Um, when people are, or especially um, boundaries around respect, uh, respectfulness for staff, um, when we allow people to try and move those boundaries and often people with, a, who are walking around with a lot of trauma are testing the boundaries. They wanna see where the boundaries are. It's important for us to compassionately, respectfully reinforce those and let people know, yes, these are the boundaries. They are still there, I'm holding them. And they are, are still there. And when I say compassionately, I think it's important to bear in mind with all of this that we wanna be thinking about our communication with patients and families 
the way we think about um, ourselves in the, that situation and our um, our family members who might be vulnerable. And most of us, I think, have probably a family member or a few that probably present in medical settings in ways that are not, um, you know, always ideal. Maybe we ourselves sometimes do that when we are anxious. And um, so I think it's important to bear in mind that, again, there is no us and them. We are the patients. So we want to treat people the way that we expect to be treated, um, that we would want to be treated. Um, trustworthiness and transparency, same thing. Clarity and consistency when there are staffing changes of any type. And this stuff is all equally important for the non-clinical front office staff as it is for providers and clinical support. Um, we need to let people know that there's been a staffing change or there's been a workflow change or we're changing the space um, in, our, in our healthcare setting and this is what you can expect. People need to know what to expect. This is also true in terms of exams asking permission to touch, um, letting people know ahead of time what's going to happen, uh, that introducing yourself, how long is this going to take, what's going to happen next, all of that stuff is really, really important. It's always important, but even more so when you're working with a patient with trauma. Um, peer support, our community resources, somehow over the last, I feel like several years, there's a couple of fields like education and healthcare who that have kind of assumed all responsibility for all things about all people. And that's not sustainable um, and it's not um, appropriate. We have community resources. We have peer support organizations for mental health, for substance use. We have a lot of community partners with um, to help people in all, with all sorts of kinds of support. So making sure you know who those folks are and how to connect with them advocating for that for your organization because this cannot fall all on the providers on the front line or the front or the front facing staff to make sure that that information is readily accessible so we can we can connect people with peer support um, collaboration and mutuality if I have like one bottom line value that I go back to every single time um, especially when I am just heart sick about um, things going on in the community and in the world community. Um, it, it really is that shared hum humanity. There are so many ways if you look at social media or watch the news um, to find differences and find disagreement and, and take issue with, with something that someone says or does. There is always some element, almost always of shared humanity, some way to connect and find common ground um, and identify. And I think that if you think about your health care, your own health care, your child's health care, or anyone in your family, that was excellent, where you walked out and you're like, that person, I would follow them anywhere. I, you know, those for me, are always the people who are present, authentic, and genuinely seem to care about what's ha what happens to me. Um, and so I think that's that it's really important to bear that in mind that the healing happens in connection. Empowerment is just making sure people have real choices. Um, and then cultural, historical, and gender issues, I just want to throw out there, uh, bearing in mind, especially what's happening on the world stage in the Middle East. Um, there's many members of our community that identify strongly with folks affected by those conflicts in Ukraine, all really all over the world, and um, Somalia, that we want to we want to make sure that our organizations, however possible, represent the community, identify um, marginalized populations that includes people with socioeconomic disparity, um, and that we not only hire people that reflect our community, but we promote them into leadership positions. Next slide, please. So just lastly, one of, the bottom line is recovery and healing from trauma are possible. Um, there are protective factors that facilitate healing and resilience. And, you know, the, there was a lot early in the pandemic and a few years ago about self-care and people even now saying, you know, make sure you do your self-care. Yes, but uh, care for others. Let's care for each other. Um, a lot of this strife and um, the terrible stuff going on 
came from isolation, came from people feeling alone. Um, I think the more we can uh, envelop our community and heal as a community and support one another and, and seek shared humanity and identification with our community members, the better. Thank you. Thanks so much, Desi. That was a perfect intro to, to my part. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Courtney Pladson. Um, as Lisa mentioned, I'm the main care medical director, but I'm also a primary care provider. I work clinically in the healthcare for the homeless clinic in Portland, uh, where I've worked for the past six years. Um, and so I, in my practice, um, I am used to caring for people that have significant trauma histories in particular. One thing that I wanted to really highlight about this moment is that our health systems are well equipped and our staff are used to caring for patients that have experienced significant trauma. But when a trauma happens at a community level, at a state level, um, our providers are also patients in these instances. And so the load is nuanced and particularly challenging when we have these stacking traumas on top of one another. So trauma doesn't happen in a bubble. It doesn't just happen to one individual. It, it impacts people individually. It impacts families, it impacts peer groups, organizations, schools, and um, societally. And so it is important to think of how we can have interventions at each of these levels to support people in their response in healing and resilience uh, and developing resilience in, in response to these events. And so, as Jesse mentioned, the focus on self-care, yes, it is important. And self-care in response to a system level failure, a system level trauma will always be insignificant. It will always not be enough. And so we really want to think of how do we create systems or cultures uh, that are trauma informed and are that are really focusing on supporting people to heal um, in relation with others. In thinking about those trauma responses in neurobiology, I found this slide helpful because not only are we thinking about that for patients, but we can see these trauma responses in each other as staff and peers and within our organization. And so we are used to having uh, some of the challenges that come up at the front desk. We might have a patient who's late who has said, sorry, you missed your appointment and that might be triggering or overwhelming. And, and I feel like our staff have the skills for that. But what happens when um, the fight or the anger is coming from a colleague or that um, with that person that could have really tolerated a difficult interaction with a patient now is very confrontational or a provider, uh, a staff member who is avoidant um, and having a lot of panic and that energy is felt by a team or in the freeze, that person is shutting down. They might be calling out of work. They might not have the energy to show up in the way that they have previously. And then we have a, the fawn um, type here, which might be people pleasing, or I really think about this in the workplace as lack of boundaries, staff that struggle to, um, when a patient is sharing that they are struggling to pay for something, or they are reaching out to the staff member over and over, and the staff member gives their personal cell phone, and some of those boundaries that they had before are now breaking down. These are all trauma responses, and it's important for us to recognize them as such, and these are typical, and there are things that we can do as organization, as teams, to recognize them as trauma, and not that the person is a bad person or that they're not working hard enough. And how do we provide this support to our peers and, and our team members and as leaders to our organization? So I just wanted to provide some various examples of how this trauma response can show up in the workplace. So. There are some various ways. Um, so there are vicarious trauma, burnout, moral injury, vicarious resilience. There's a lot of words here. But what I wanted to articulate is that there are ways that the way that organizations respond to trauma can either help or continue to hurt and cause harm for their staff. So vicarious trauma is the way in which um, if a clinical team is hearing all of these painful stories. They're seeing it on the news, but they're showing up into the clinic or hospital and they're seeing and bearing witness to suffering over and over. We can start to become negatively impacted by that trauma. Um, and it shows up similarly in brain scans, the type of trauma if you're directly impacted or vicariously impacted. 
And this can go on to lead to burnout. Our cups can only handle so much. And if someone is seeing 15, 20 patients a day of just handing, of having to hold so much trauma, that can go on to lead to burnout. And with that same clinical day, the same structure, but different types of support or a different perspective, it can, the response can lead to vicarious resilience. So there is, in the same way that we can be harmed by hearing other people's trauma, if we are seeing and looking for the resilience, we can also fill our cups with that resilience. And that really comes from bearing witness to other people. So when we're seeing our colleagues, the way that they are showing up for their community, the way that our patients in the face of so much adversity, is, are, we're able to witness their capacity to heal and them take care of themselves and others, it can really reaffirm the value of the work that we do. So one of the things I wanted to say that can be some of the nuanced difference here is the way that we talk about this as colleagues or as teams, the way that we talk about patient experiences and the way that our staff use language um, can also continue, if we're continuing to dump that trauma onto our other staff members, um, that can continue to add to this trauma. One of the tools that I personally have found very helpful is if in the beginning of my clinical practice, I was really an empathetic listener. I would take on all of my patients' pain. I would physically feel it at times. I would be so emotionally moved and overwhelmed. And what I learned over time is rather than being an empathetic listener, I became a compassionate observer. And it's still the same way to show up. You are still bearing witness, but I'm not taking on all of that pain and trauma myself. I am witnessing humanity and I'm showing compassion for that person but it's not my pain to hold. And talking to your team about the nuanced difference there can make a big difference in the way that what they, the baggage that they leave their clinic day with every day. And if we're able to be compassionate observers, it leaves us space for that vicarious resilience. And there's some structures that I'm gonna talk about where we can help support this for our team members. So there are many factors that contribute to individual resilience and person how, including how a person views and engages with the world in particular. And a lot of that has to do with social resources, their own positive coping strategies that have been de developed over time. And developing individual resilience is important, but the onus on maintaining well-being in the workplace solely lies, it does not solely lie with the employee. I can be the most resilient person in the world, but work in a caustic system that will break me down over time. And so we want to work on strengthening both. We want us resilience um, teams and staff, clinical staff, and we want resilient organizations that support healing. And so we want, we need to be able to nurture and to promote both. So wanted to show how we move from individual less level trauma-informed care uh, to system level. And so obviously in the trauma-specific services for individuals, that's therapy, that there are lots of evidence-based, that's medication, that's, um, there's all specific things that we can do to support an individual. Um, but then as we move towards organizational level, state agencies, community-wide, we need to take more of universal approach to addressing trauma and promoting resilience. And here are some examples how we can move from becoming trauma reactive to becoming a healing organization. And so on the left, this is very trauma reactive. This is, um, again, if you think of the principles that Jesse laid out, these are really the opposite. Um, it's a lack of safety. It's overwhelming. Things are really rigid. Um, they feel very numb and depersonalized. Um, and that's going to continue to add to trauma to people, um, to individuals' plate. Trauma-informed. It really, the whole goal first is trying not to add more trauma. It is recognizing sociocultural trauma, widespread impact, and recognizing the effects of trauma on individuals and teams in response by shifting their practice. Um, so there's levels within this from client, from the clients, staff to systems and leadership. And then what we really want to work towards is becoming trauma reducing and becoming a healing organization where we really embody as organizations those values of becoming integrated, reflective, collaborative, relation-centered, again, that shared humanity, seeing people as whole humans and not just their job, growth and prevention-oriented, flexible, adaptive, and equitable, and inclusive. So this is really, we want to start from at least first start decreasing the harm that we, we are causing and really trying to shift towards promoting healing. 
So one avenue um, of really focusing on promoting the promotion of healing is something called healing-centered engagement. Healing-centered approach views trauma not simply as an individual isolated experience, so I don't experience this trauma by myself, but rather highlights the ways in which trauma and healing are experienced collectively. And this right now in Lewiston and our broader community in Maine is really what I feel like I can see people needing and wanting. It's that connection. It's not just going and experiencing and processing this alone. Um, it's really how do we connect as a community and help come together as a community to work towards healing and resilience. So some of the aspects of healing-centered engagement, it supports providers with their own healing. Part of this is recognizing everyone has strengths. Everyone has um, an ability to heal. Our bodies are wired that way. We get a cut, our body goes to healing. The same thing happens with our brain. Our, our body wants to go to homeostasis and heal. And so we have lots of internal strengths within us. So we want to identify and promote those strengths. It asks systems to build structures to address the realities facing the health staff, knowing that our health staff is being asked to do more and more all the time. And how can we as a system give all the tools necessary to do this work well? It asks what, it asks what is right with you rather than what is wrong with you, seeing that there are inherent strengths um, in everybody. And it builds on experience, knowledge, skills, and curiosity as positive traits to be enhanced. Every staff member on your team brings something valuable in their lived experience. Um, and each of those ways that they react to trauma, they also have different ways of um, coping mechanisms and strengths that we can draw on to. And we want to really try to find ways to promote those strengths. So ways that um, organizations can support individual resilience um, we want to offer workplace flexibility when possible. Maybe, you know, we know that so much of healthcare is in person, but how do we provide an afternoon where someone can work from home or decrease unnecessary meetings? How do we say we're going to repurpose a meeting to uh, try to have some shared space for the staff? How do we encourage the use of PTO? Knowing, I know that we're all stretched thin, um, but that is we want people to be able to step away when they need to and use the time that they've earned. Um, this is something Jesse and I spoke about that not every profession has supervision in the same way that um, social work and therapists do. And maybe this is something that we need to consider for all of our clinical staff. How do we promote nurses and providers have supervision when they're carrying so much trauma, when you're holding so much pain? How do we work with colleagues, our peers, our supervisors who may have more skills um, at holding this level of trauma. So really trying to work on the supervisory model that can promote healing and resilience and continuing to acknowledge shared humanity amongst our staff um, and acknowledging that it's not just this event, um, it is what's happening in our, our own home and personal lives, it's what's happening uh, all over, over the country and this traumatic event. How do we acknowledge all that people are holding right now? Make sure we're promoting mental health benefits that people have access to in the workplace, ADP and others, um, help making sure that people are aware of what um, is possible. And we know that there are many first responders and nurses and physician groups that have peer um, possibilities and support too. Um, there's lots of national organizations that provide that. So there's lots of ways that we can connect people to those that um, might be able to hold space for them and have a, a specific level of understanding and recognize how staff may be differently impacted. So really thinking about the equity here, I just wanna recognize in particular staff that are peers, community health workers, our frontline staff um, are, that are going out into the communities that um, often don't have just the 15 minute appointments like I have, where you know that I'm going in to sit with a patient and then I'm going on to the next. They might be holding space for people for hours. They might be having um, really working with those that have been the most impacted in our communities. So I just want to, and they might be most personally impacted just by their role as community health workers or peer support too. And so I just want to recognize the level that not everyone in our staff has the same um, level of impact. And we want to make sure that we're recognizing and providing support uh, for those that might be more significantly or directly impacted. And then supporting team resilience. There, these are just um, some suggestions or different tools that you could take back. And in the notes of my slides, I have some um, links as well to some additional resources. 
Um, so again, just thinking about how all different, the different staff members that might be impacted. And um, just, I, I don't know if there's like data on this to support, but in my 12 years of primary care, I will say the front desk can get the worst of people at times. Um, and by the time they come back in my office and I'm talking with them, they're, you know, I have a relationship and they're very kind, but sometimes that front desk, they can be anonymous, they don't know them, and they can just be very difficult or aggressive. And just wanting to recognize them, if, if we have a community level trauma response and that front desk might be the first person that they're interacting with in the health system, how can we make sure we're checking with the front desk and making sure that they, they are being supported and they are also getting trauma-informed care training and understanding what's happening and that it's not about them. It's, it is about what's happening in the community. So just really thinking about each individual person on the team and how they're differently impacted or could be bearing more weight to other people's trauma. Um, facilitating team activities, um, here's some different suggestions. So when, if we are, ex because of the load that everyone's carrying, our teams have very high levels of stress. And as we have mentioned, everyone's stress responses are different. Um, it can be really helpful to sit as a team and say, here are my signs of stress um, and what is helpful for me in that moment. Um, if you start seeing me running down halls, which I do if I'm behind, um, give me some space and I need to get caught up. Um, and other people might say that I need, um, I would just tap me on the shoulder and ask if I'm doing okay if I display these signs. Other people want to be left alone. Um, there are different, lots of different ways um, that we can sh share signs of stress, but if we are sharing them out loud with our colleagues, that's also giving them permission to identify them or reflect them back to us in a neutral way rather than accusatory or um, get agitated by those. And if we can also help share what helps us, um, that can be a helpful way for us to support each other at times of stress. Um, one of the things we mentioned is trying to hold uh, or put pauses on unnecessary meetings or topics and trying to create more space for check-ins. And here's some just really simple ways that we can provide check-ins even with larger teams. Um, one is just having everyone go around the room and just saying one word of how they're feeling. Uh, and obviously anyone can always pass, but it's just a nice way to get a temperature gauge on how the room is doing, how your team is doing. Um, if you have, are having every single person being overwhelmed, stressed, at my max, um, that is really helpful. And it is important for us to recognize it maybe not everyone is at that level and that is good and important too. And so how do we create just even little basic spaces for folks to share? Um, Rosebud Dorn is a personal favorite um, where we ask people to share. Um, a thorn is something that is really difficult or thorny right now. Um, it gives people the opportunity to share what they're struggling with. Um, the bud is sharing opportunities that are waiting to blossom or things that they're excited about coming down the pike, um, things that they're looking forward to. Um, you know, for me, it could be thorn right now is I'm feeling so overwhelmed by my workload or amount of patients I need to see, but a bud is Thanksgiving is coming up and I can't wait to spend that time with my family. And the rose is something, um, a positive outcome or a success. Um, I, Mr. Jones was really struggling, but now I see like he has been going to groups and he's been really enjoying that. And he came in last week and made a really positive experience for the first time in six months. And sometimes just giving people the opportunity to share um, these, and it takes moments. I mean, it's just literally less than a minute sometimes. It helps to show and see our shared humanity and also helps people to identify what they're struggling with, something to look forward to and to share success. And that can be sometimes that shift that we need for that vicarious resilience of seeing things that, and sharing the successes um, and seeing something positive that we can share. Cause I know it's hard. We don't want to always dwell and everyone's overwhelmed, everyone's stressed and everyone's been in the space for a long time. So how do we also create opportunities to share positive um, things personally and, and professionally? And lastly, the, the sharing patient successes. Um, really, these are times that we can share that vicarious trauma and helps us reconnect back to the why, why we do this work. Um, and that could be really important to reconnect with that in this moment where the work is really hard. Um, oh, one more thing I wanted to share is um, thinking of the why. When times of really significant stress and trauma, it can be helpful for team members to take turns. And we can do this over, you know, one person can go with staff meeting 
but create space for people to share why they got into this work, why this job, why now, why here. And that really helps connect people back to their personal mission, their passions. Um, when you get lost in the details or the systems that get so overwhelming, it can be helpful for people to reconnect back with that. And that really helps the team see that person through that light as well. If we're not being our best selves, we are so overwhelmed. It can help people see them um, in, in this other context of why they came, began to do this work in the first place. So it can be helpful for the individual and for the team. So just some really small ways that um, I just really wanted to share a few interventions or a few little things that you could try to take back to your team that you can implement really easily um, that can help to shift perspectives and create a little bit more space um, for sharing and um, connecting with one another. But that's it. And um, Jesse and I, both our emails are here. If folks have any particular questions that you want to follow up on, we're, we're happy to talk further um, individually. But at this point, I'm going to take down my slides and I'd like to um, open things up if folks have any questions. We're happy to um, answer them or if you want to put anything in the chat, we can we can answer that as well. Terrific. Well, thanks so much, uh, Courtney and Jesse. That was a lot of terrific information. Really appreciate you taking the time to share that and your expertise as well. Um, I would encourage folks, if you would like, to uh, uh, unmute and or come on camera, or you certainly could use the chat box as well to ask any questions. So let me just pause for a moment and see if anybody would like to ask anything. All right. Um, well, I'm going to ask a question. So if folks do not have somebody on staff who maybe has the level of experience or expertise that you have, Courtney or Jesse, and are, you know, seeing, I, I suspect a lot of this might have resonated with them and feel like, oh my gosh, it's all so overwhelming. You, you gave some um, great mm, tips on things like, um, you know, how to maybe open up conversations, but where, where do they start? Like, what would you suggest they start with? And either Jesse or Courtney. Uh, you know, I would, I would say where we are starting here um, in Northern Light Practices is establishing kind of a basic language for, for trauma-informed care, like baseline education for everyone in the practice and in the staff and brief right? Because there's no time. <laughs> so which is part of the problem. But working within the structure of your practice, if you have somebody at your organization, if you have an interest in learning more about trauma-informed care and healthcare teams, um, please feel free to reach out and let us know, either one of us. We'd be happy to share some resources and training. There's many of them uh, available. And what we've done is bring that back to these teams. We, you know, on, in Northern Light, we made a brief video and then had sort of a discussion in the team um, just during a staff meeting. So I think really just making sure that, again, coming back to operating as a community, as we support the community, the more we're including uh, patients, front desk staff, um, people who answer the phones, billers, coders, providers, RNs, everyone having a shared language. One of the things we talk about is the difference between venting and processing. So if you have had a challenging patient encounter or a loss that you're struggling with, what we know is that we in, in these clinical roles or in healthcare, that works best if we process it with one another, right? It's important to do that. We need that. Um, but we also want to be mindful of not talking about people, whether it's colleagues or patients in a derogatory or negative way, even when we feel that, because what we need is to process our experience and kind of with that shared humanity lens, connect with another person in a similar role around that. Um, so like a small, even smaller than the training thing you can do is ask for five minutes on the staff meeting agenda every month or every other month and just open this conversation up a little bit. Suggest that that there there's a way that we come to an agreement in this practice about how we're going to deal with it when we feel overwhelmed or we've had a difficult encounter. Who should we go to? Who can we talk to? 
I think those just little tiny things can can start that cultural change. Great, that's really helpful. Thank you. Courtney, anything else from your end or? You know, I um, this is a little ad adjacent, but I just wanted to share something we implemented our, on our team. Um, we, we found, so our team, because we are healthcare for the homeless in Portland, we have had so much loss. We have had so much, um, so much overdose death in particular. And just as Jesse shared, um, these losses, um, you know, these individuals we saw daily, weekly. I mean, I've seen some of these patients more than my family members and we've become so deeply connected with them. And often times the clients see us as their family. And those losses are felt so intensely and to share with a colleague or friend or to share with a spouse or friend doesn't do it justice because they didn't know that person. And we really found um, that having time and space to share grief and share stories and talk about reflect on the person it really helped our team. And so part of the way that we institutionalize that was um, every staff our once a month team meeting we put a tree on the wall and we would write their name on a leaf and we put it there and we would anyone who wanted to share reflect um, on that person or share a story would do so and then over time um, we say are we ready to take this leaf down and it just gives us some time and space for grief and for joy and for all the complexity of uh, of loss um, and if we don't set aside time for that, then that builds within each of us. And so we're all gonna have different types of stress or loss or grief, um, but trying to put a structure in place feels is incredibly valuable and it doesn't have to be a ton of time. It can be five, 10 minutes, um, but that's just one small practice that we do regularly that we have found to be um, profoundly helpful rather than um, we we were just, it felt like one loss after another and we just couldn't cope. We didn't have time and space and it's like, oh my gosh, here's one more loss. We never, we didn't even talk about this through, you know, one person. And so this way we can memorialize it regularly um, and built it into our, our team kind of culture. Yeah, that's a great, good point. And sadly, you know, recognizing that this latest Lewiston events come on top of an ongoing exactly. space of losses and um, epidemic that we've had. Oh, from that for the past many years as well. So yeah, thank you. Um, all right. Any other questions? I'm gonna maybe shift gears here. If not, to just share a few more things and we'll close. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so I am just gonna note a couple more things. So we um do have many resources that have been um uh, developed. Let me just get this back onto the slideshow here. Um through the governor's office and main DHHS. So um there's a governor's webpage, but then a specific uh, page for providers. I've got the links here. We'll, we'll share these um, slides afterwards as well, uh, both generally for behavioral health resources and then uh, for providers where recordings of these uh, webinars as well as the PDFs um, are posted, and this one will be posted within the next couple of days. Um, the Healing Together is a sort of a general clearinghouse of people who both need help and want to give help. And then I specifically wanted to call out this Lewiston uh, Response Behavioral Request online form, and um, Deb Poulin from the Office of Behavioral Health is online. Uh, Deb, you want to just say a word or two about that? Because I'm not sure that all our provider groups necessarily have um, become aware of that yet. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. This particular request form is targeted to organizations, facilities, groups of individuals um, in the community or even outside of the community that are seeking behavioral health support for their team members. Um, that is often in the form of a trauma-informed debriefing. It may also be offering individual one-on-one -on -one support on site um, and also doing some trauma education. Um, in groups and teams. So if that's something that you feel your organization or team would benefit from, then I would encourage you to fill out the online request form. It's very short. Um, I'm looking at them myself and we are connecting to the most local and appropriate resources for you. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks so much, Deb. And again, we just encourage folks to um, think about that if you're looking for additional help. Um, there are other resources for um, individuals as well. The biggest change is the opening of the Lewis Community Resiliency Center on Main Street. So it is open now. Um, 
and uh, available to uh, victims, survivors, first responders and their families. Um, I, I know they've had quite a robust uh, uh, response um, in terms of these first few days. Um, there have been other resources as well. I think some of these are winding down as the Resiliency Center is open, but um, again, just a, a range of resources available to people and uh, providers to be aware of. Um, there are some uh, standing resources available as well. Uh, AAP did a great um, webinar early on about um, psychological first aid supporting children after mass violence. We've got the recording again on our website. We have the Maine Pediatric and Behavioral Health Partnership that comes out of um, the Office of Child and Family Services now, and they are a terrific resource in terms of both um, trainings that can be scheduled and uh, things that have uh, recordings that are available already on a whole range of topics. Uh, the Red Cross, Cross Guide to Psychological First Aid is a great sort of national resource. And then the Maine Association of Psychiatric Physicians um, offer volunteer psychiatrists to do one-on-one -on -one consultation with primary care providers uh, through a contract with the Office of Behavioral Health and just uh, uh, put the contact there. So um, with that, um, any additional questions, discussions, suggestions? All right. Uh, well, in that case, we will wrap it up. We had, again, planned this initial series as a series of three. We are exploring other opportunities where we might be able to offer some ongoing educational resources, uh, but always happy to take suggestions or thoughts for that. Uh, I am uh, certainly always available. Um, my name and number, uh, contact info are on that last slide, but resale.letourneau.main.gov. Appreciate everybody's attention today. And thank you again so much, Jesse and Courtney, for um, joining us. Uh, and uh, hope everybody takes care, uh, is able to reflect and have some time off next week for the Thanksgiving holiday. But I really appreciate everybody's attention to this and all the support you're offering to your patients and our communities. Thank you. Bye-bye.